Hey, welcome to an extra slice uh, with my burgeoning ukulele skills. My name's Nick and I'm the Vicar of St George's. Welcome. If you're first time joining us, we've got loads of these on here. We do a little bit of an extra slice into the sermon that we've just preached for this week. I'm wearing a hat today because it's cold and uh, that's where we are today. Ephesians is the passage we're reading from, Ephesians 1, starting in chapter, verse 15. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Now, uh, Paul is writing to a community, that we've said before, he already knows. Indeed, he knows them well. He spent several years with this community. And if we flip to the back, he's sending to them Titius, who's going to... Uh, encourage them in some kind of way. So it's a community he knows well. But what, it's something about when um, you know a community well, but then you hear a report about them from some other source, and you can tell, uh, you know, how things are going. Journalists do this all the time, don't they? When they seek not just one source, but multiple sources to say this seems to be the case, and it's being confirmed or something like that. And what he's heard about them is your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. I think that in lots of ways is a, is a, is a, is a microcosm, a small taste of what uh, Jesus' great commandments to love our Lord, uh, our, the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and to love our neighbour as ourself. But here, uh, given that particular emphasis upon the saints being those who are also in the church, it's a reminder to us. Uh, we often talk in church a lot about how important it is to be reaching out. If you hear me preach, that's one of the things I'm saying again and again and again. However, I, the very strong New Testament theme that um, not only will those outside the church know how well we love, uh, how, how distinctive we are because of the way we love one another. And there the emphasis is on, oh, that people outside will know how, how good you are if you love one another. But no, 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 love one another. That there is to be a unity within the church that's seeking unity, uh, trying to be a place of reconciliation, trying to be a place of love in, uh, for, in and for one another is part of our identity as church. Now, I'm not touching on any um, political issues or wider questions in the church here with, with that statement. It's just that that is a very strong New Testament theme that shouldn't be um, undermined in any kind of way. Jesus' final prayer, indeed, John 17, is that we might be one. I don't cease to give thanks for you as I remember you, my prayers. Thanksgiving is one of the great points of prayer something we need to be doing as a people of God. You know, it's not a, a trendy faithfulness uh, journey, of like a thankful journey, journey, journaling or something like that. No, thanksgiving is the base, one of the basic forms of prayer for the Christian. And um, it's not, it's, uh, it's doing something in that we're giving thanks to God, we're giving honour to him, we're offering worship. It's not doing something, it's not trying to intercede, it's not trying to do something in prayer. Um, but I think that goes in lots of ways to the heart of what prayer is it's about a, a statement um, of our relationship with God. It's something to do with how, defining our relationship, um, but also just part of that being in relationship with with God and that peculiar type of relationship. And that's very key. That sort of language of relationship for this passage just came up in the sermon. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. And I make a big play on this in, big play, I make a big play on this, uh, emphasis on this in the sermon, where fundamentally Christianity is about knowing God. Chief end of man is to enjoy God and, and love, and to enjoy God and love him forever. Um, so if was like, no, love, enjoy God. Uh, chief end of man is to enjoy God forever. And so, you know, to, to know, to enjoy him is absolutely fundamental. Um, and that same, you know, that, that thanks, thanksgiving is fundamental to that relationship. Um, and now with the eyes of, verse 18, with the eyes of your heart enlightened. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of um, stuff in contemporary church about the difference between the, the head and the heart. That's a really a foreign, um, foreign change to the Bible. The Bible, the heart, um, is the source of a person, but it's also the, the, that can speak for the totality of a person, um, where your treasure lies, there your heart is also. So it, it's not to do with, you know, intellect versus emotion, which is how these things are often portrayed. That's really not a biblical thought. It's a very Western thought coming um, particularly... Uh, you know, from people like Rene Descartes, who wanting to separate um, with sort of 
Platonic from Plato roots, you know, where they've got the division between body and soul, um, much more in the Hebrew Hebrew understanding, and therefore to shape Christian understanding, is the sense that the body and soul, the body and mind, the heart and the mind are one; they're connected, um, and that's that's also comes out here where we've got this emphasis upon knowledge of stuff, so knowledge of. Um, what what it is that we've been called to the hope that we've been called to but also knowledge in a more effective way affective way as in to know the power of god and both of those emphases are there and and for for the hebrew mind and therefore as i say for the christian mind it's intended that when when our heart is changed it's the whole of the person not just one bit so much has gone wrong in the in the church when we've emphasized um only you know, a, a strict formalism where it's only about getting the, exactly the precise words um, and then, you know, being, being incredibly precise about the words but not expressing our love. Um, and on the other hand, to say, oh, you know, it's all about love and then actually forgetting that there is a form that that takes within the Bible uh, very much so. And uh, you can fill in the gaps in your own history about where uh, you've seen that at different points. In fact, talk to me, send me messages if you'd like to talk more about that. I also want to emphasise here uh, the um, the way that the Trinity is used as a basic structure for the way that is underlying the way Paul understands the work of God, but also the way that uh, it's just there in the text. And so we have in in this, and this isn't the first time in this first chapter, we had that very much uh, in verse 3. So I talked about this in another extra slice, but in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're there together with what? He has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. Very much the spirits coming in there. Um, verse 17, then again, we have something similar. Pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Interesting phrase there, Father of glory. We'll come back to that. Maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, may give you a spirit. So we've got Father, Son and Spirit there, co-working within the same passage. Now, what's interesting about that? Especially uh, for Christians who are wanting to, uh, Trinit- all Christians are Trinitarian. If you're not Trinitarian Christian, not Christian. It's one of the dividing lines of Christianity. Um, but it's implicit within the text, and it rather than being explicit. And the reason I say that is because the language and the the word Trinity isn't really coined until quite a lot later in the church's development. It's a man called Tertullian who comes up with a word um, to try and express the threeness that we see in the scripture. Um, but and, so, and sometimes those who aren't from Trinitarian uh, sects, so the sects we think of the Unitarian, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, who aren't who who aren't Christian by the Trinitarian test, um, they they want to say that Trinity only came in later and wasn't there in the original uh, original Bible. Um, and it's true in one sense that the, the phrase uh, Trinity is not biblical. It's not there anyway. But instead, it's a conceptual framework which doesn't make the Bible doesn't make any sense without it. The Bible doesn't make any sense without without that framework of speaking of God as a Trinity, and it comes out so richly in this passage: the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom. And so we see that Trinitarian action. Uh, we praying to uh, to the Father through the Son that the spirit might be given. Uh, we see this all the way through when we think about uh, the work of creation. God, the Father, speaks. The word he speaks is uh, is the Son, John, John's Gospel tells us. And then indeed, it's the creation happens through the power of the spirit, bringing order from that chaos. And probably the most explicit uh, section is the, uh, the, bapt- the baptism and resurrection, probably. Interesting how they're so connected. So you've got the baptism where the father, uh, it's the son who's being baptized into the water. It's the spirit. The spirit then descends on the son and it's the father who speaks, affirming, uh, behold, my son. So that's a really wonderful example. The resurrection, which comes out later in this passage, it is the son who is raised in the power of the spirit by the will of the father. So again and again and again, this Trinitarian structure, fundamental to the way the Bible understands itself um, and sometimes implicitly pres- present. Uh, and Ephesians is a very good example. I'm not going to talk to you about the in- in glorious inheritance among the saints um, because uh, we talked about that one before. Now, I think we've probably... Uh, this father of glory, I think, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful 
title because it combines that wonderful sense of God's fatherliness, uh, his, his, desire, his, his desire to come to us as father. Remember, God doesn't have to be anything. God can be what God wants. You know, he could have come to us as a, as a tyrant or something, but he comes to us as a father, not only creating us, but, you know, actually wanting to have a relationship with us, a father, be a father to us. But also, he's not just any, you know, not any other dad. You know, it's so easy when we use that language of intimacy to then shrink God into, you know, I don't know, somebody looks like me or, you know, our images of dad in some kind of way. No, the father of not just any father, but the father of glory, the effervescent, um, shining, tabernacling presence of God. Fantastic there. The father of glory is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we'll talk a bit more in the next one. I was only really able to do three verses in this wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful passage. I hope you've enjoyed this extra slice. If you enjoy them, please tell me. Thank you so much to Jane, who one person who texted me from last week. If you enjoy them, please tell me and I'll make some more. And I might even get better at ukulele over time. God bless. See you very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>